The history of high-consequence testing at Sandia National Labs started in the 1940s with an awareness of war disaster situations and a determination to test for every conceivable combat situation that would in time become a world-class nuclear weapons testing complex for the nation. Sandia's origins in high-consequence testing began with developing an array of facilities to look at different ways atomic bombs could fail, from creating extremes of heat and cold to simulating violent force through explosives and energetics. High-consequence testing translates into high stakes, either in terms of cost, value, or risk, or the inability to repeat a test. Some people refer to it as one-shot physics, meaning you only have one chance to get it right. Finding critical weaknesses and torturing weapons to failure were common objectives during that era. Many of the early Sandia engineers were World War II veterans, and they witnessed firsthand weapon systems that hadn't worked under combat conditions like German diesel engines that couldn't be restarted in the frigid cold of Russian winters, and Japanese torpedoes that wouldn't detonate after they hit their target. So they tested for everything. Because in the world of atomic bomb testing with the real threat of atomic annihilation during the height of the Cold War, there was no room for error, there were no second chances, and there were no do-overs. Oh, we got a defense system, a weapon system that we're saying that, uh, hey, it's going to protect the United States, we're going to protect the world and that, and we got to make sure it's going to work. You know, it was cutting edge, on your seat, trying to engineering and, and testing that nobody does before that, like that. That's why they come to San Diego to do it in those days, because nobody else would do it. That, that's what we do. We create and dissipate kinetic energy. Everything that we do is around that. They're shaking things, rattling things, rolling things, just to see how things react under those conditions. Climatic and shock testing were initially conducted inside Sandia's Tech Area 1. But then more specialized facilities were built farther away from the main population of the labs. First in Coyote Canyon on Kirtland Air Force Base, then in Tech Area 2, and finally in a newly established Tech Area 3 that was created exclusively for high-consequence testing activities, which is sometimes referred to as environmental testing. In the early 1950s, the labs began to build numerous large-scale test apparatuses that were quite ingenious and just downright scary. By Manzano, we had, I think, 30 bazooka rockets that would propel a Mark 7 on a pendulum. Then came the rocket-powered centrifuge. I believe the maximum was four thiokol rockets that were nine feet long each, but they were detonated with, with black powder. Then, Sandia built a 2,000-foot sled track in 1953. This is the south end of the 2,000-foot sled track. This rail gauge, that is the spacing between the rail, was set to, because nobody really knew at that time how do you design a sled track, it was set to be kind of narrow gauge railroad rail width. And if you're trying to drive a rocket sled fast, that's a poor design choice. And the reason is you get very big frontal area of the sled, and at high speeds, the air drag is tremendous. I think there's an adrenaline rush that people like me get working in that environment. Uh, and I don't get that ad adrenaline rush anymore. <laughs> you know, seeing a rocket plume light up uh, one end of the track and not hear a sound and then see this streak of light fly past you and then after it's already down the end of the track and exploded and then you hear the sonic boom. And then you hear the boom from the impact, you know, and, and these are, uh, you know, very visceral, powerful sensations you feel. You feel the concussion in your chest, you know, you hear it in your ears and your eyes don't believe what you just saw, that it went that fast. 
people are always calling, hey, can I come out and watch a sled track test? They're, they're, they're very sexy. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of energy and stuff. And, and, but some of the tests that we do here and over at Max Shock or the drop tower, while they might be, not be as dramatic, uh, as when you're using explosives, there's there's just as much engineering and planning and and uh, um, uh, challenge, you know, in, in executing those things successfully. You know, it takes us a month to set things up, and then within a few milliseconds, you knew whether you had it close or not. We have the 35 foot or the yeah the 35 foot centrifuge behind me. Uh, this was kind of the, the next generation of centrifuges that we had, large centrifuges that we had, and uh, was you know also set up to do testing with explosives and, and materials with, with uh, uh, units with rad, et cetera. So there was an early story that uh, they had a, a full up uh, classified uh, uh, reentry vehicle on the end of the arm. It failed and it came off, and the arm came around like a baseball bat and hit it and it ended up to be a pop fly. It actually flew out of Area 3, and, and at that time, at that time, uh, you know, these are hazardous test facilities, and we do everything that we can to keep them safe and make sure that, uh, that, that nobody is affected outside of that. What did they do? They got in their pickup truck, and they drove, and they went outside of Area 3, and they went back out in the Mesa out there, and they picked the unit up, and they drove it back into Area 3, and, and went, okay, mum's the word. But they discovered something, and they learned something about that that helped, that helped discovery for the, for the future. To finish the cycle of torture for a given design, Sandia has erected this 300-foot drop tower. Tests like these give the answers to problems of shock and its effect on weapon components. Continuous testing through every phase of design and construction gives a high degree of reliability and product integrity where it counts out in service, where failure might well mean disaster. And it also had a 50-foot deep pool that allowed for water and back dust. I think it was the F-111 uh, escape module was tested there. Uh, Navy torpedoes have been tested there. Throughout the weapon uh, stockpile to target sequence um, has a number of environments that have water associated with it. So we launch missiles from submarines out of the water. Uh, we, we do, we have uh, missiles, or we had bombs that were, uh, that were actually used in the water. The labs also built a giant device based on the concept of a child slingshot that powered an accelerator. It used a thousand bungee cords to supply nearly half a million pounds of force to generate over 50 times the pull of gravity. Sandia's 26-inch air gun can produce an accelerating force of 1,200,000 pounds, enough to give a 400-pound test item a 1,350-g shock pulse. The gun barrel is 92 feet long. A shorter barrel above the muzzle acts as an air trap. Yeah, this is me, here. Right at the time this photograph was taken, uh, we had just completed the experiment and he was pushing the piston down very gently. Um, well, th th with the 26 inch diameter, there was like 630 square inches on the end of, the, of, of any shape that you had in there. So you had to move it very carefully or that would come shooting out where I'm looking into over here. Data acquisition was a huge part of eye consequence testing, and Sandia's photometrics department played a critical role in capturing this vital information. It started out as a very labor-intensive activity because most of the data was initially obtained by hand. When we would record data from these tests, it would go on to tape recorders. The tape recorders would be sent to Area 3 for data reduction, and uh, it kind of blows your mind to think of it now, but the data reduction consisted of a, a strip chart that was perhaps 12 inches wide, and you might have a dozen uh, signatures on that strip chart. So you had a flexible ruler that you tried to determine from the calibration step that went on there, what the amplitude and the magnitude of the uh, 
signature that you were recording. When we started, I mean, we had our own mechanical, electrical, optical, you know, whatever engineers. They were building a lot of the things that we had used, you know, film-based cameras, you know, designed and developed here at Sandia. So I think for photometrics, we're in a really interesting time period. Historically, the people who worked in our group, they really did amazing work. It was almost phenomenal they could get the data uh, and imaging in the conditions they had to work. As most people know today, it's easy to pick up your iPhone. You can take a picture, you get a beautiful picture. But back when we had 16 millimeter film, it was really hard to get good data, high speed images. Uh, if you didn't have your timing right, there was no room for error. The decade of the 1960s ushered in new challenges based on new threats. In 1960, a 185-foot drop tower was added to the lake facility, and a radiant heat facility was built to simulate re-entry environments for missiles and could reach temperatures of 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, or the melting point of iron. We, we never do the same thing twice, and that's probably the biggest attraction of the job out here. Uh, we, we burn things from railroad cars to trucks, airplane parts, small canisters, uh, all kinds of things, and, and they're all different. And they all require something new or something innovative to make it happen. In 1962, Thunder Range was established to counter the Russian ballistic missile threat of blast and radiation effects. The shock tube, uh, if you're familiar with how that operates, uh, a test item basically is hung at one end of the shock tube, suspended it and an explosive charge is placed at the other end. And you use a cable cutter to release the uh, test object just before the explosive wave contacts it. And that was a very busy area. Uh, we had probably three shock tubes in full-time operation. And uh, sometimes the number of channels we would record would exceed 100 channels. So it was a very busy time. I worked out at uh, Thunder Range with one of the older guys that had been here 30 years at that point. And uh, they put several hundred pounds of explosives at one end of the shock tube and set it off. And the 4th of July has never been the same. A water jet catapult was constructed in 1964. In 1966, a 29-foot indoor centrifuge and a 5,000-foot outdoor sled track were added to Tech Area 3. And then the, the other centrifuge we had, which is really our workhorse now, is a 29-foot centrifuge, which is underground. Um, there's not another one like it in the, in the entire nation. We can, we can uh, put 16,000 pounds of payload on the end of the arm. Um, the total uh, G-pounds is 1.6 million G-pounds and it'll do uh, 180 RPM, which is equivalent to 300 Gs. Before the, the track was extended, the, the sled never went by because uh, it was launched out in front of the building and it just went away. Uh, these observation towers that we have along the track, that's where we would sit. We would watch the tests uh, unfold in front of us. My first interview was with Dave Bickle, who's the manager for many years of the track and cables division. and. He took me out, they were doing a sled test that day, so I got to see a sled test on my interviews, and that pretty much cinched it for me what I wanted to do after that. In 1968, an aerial cable facility was built between two ridges over a mountain canyon for drop and high velocity impact testing. And since it was the only facility in the country that could duplicate an airdrop under controlled conditions, Sandia constructed another one shortly thereafter. I looked at the area that we were thinking about that might work, and I found a good place that I thought it worth investigating, so I got in my four-wheel drive truck and went out a couple of days and did some exploring, you know, on foot to kind of get the, the lay of the land and see if it would work, and I think it would. And so I went back to Mr. Bickle and I said, I think we can do it. So he said, do it. <laughs> During that time, I also worked out at the aerial cable, doing tests out there, drop tests, uh, tests where we ran a trolley across between two mountain peaks and 
fired heat-seeking missiles at it to see if we could deter them from hitting it. Three different iterations of the mobile laser tracker were used at the aerial cable facilities. Uh, I started working with uh, Dwayne Patrick uh, running the uh, laser tracking systems. Uh, and that was some unusual opportunity because laser tracking systems are unique devices in the world, really. Uh, uh, they're portable and we can we took them all over the country, uh, California to Florida. They have been all over. The capability of this thing at that time was pretty sophisticated. Most everything we did out here was one of a kind work. One of the driving factors for developing this one was this thing can track vehicles traveling at hypersonic velocity on a sled track. The 1970s and the 1980s also heralded in new technology and new innovations. Uh, it was very exciting, but unfortunately that was right in the middle of Vietnam. And uh, because of that, uh, much of my work early on in those years was uh, testing weapons, um, conventional weapons, if you will, uh, for Vietnam. Uh, my first ever uh, job was on uh, uh, testing of napalm, uh, which was some pretty uh, dramatic stuff and uh, it was my first taste of anything like that kind of thing in warfare. Uh, I was very, very young, uh, 21 years old, and um, it, um, it really had an effect on me. There were two explosive areas using a light sensitive explosive. Uh, Sandia was one and the other one Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Southwest Research in San Antonio, Texas came up with a light initiated explosive and I did visit that place uh, to see it work on and the guy was bending over with a shield spraying this looked like bubble gum onto the explosive and then he would leave and there and then he would light with a high energy capacitor set off the explosives. We were formulating explosive that was so sensitive that it was detonated with a flash of light. The, the explosive we used was silver acetylide silver nitrate. Uh, it is a primary explosive meaning easy to initiate. Uh, if you took a flash bulb from an old-fashioned camera and held it a few inches away, it would set off the explosive. Uh, we had a gun test facility where we could run any, test anything from a, a pistol up to a, you know, 155 millimeter uh, smooth bore. We had a, a firing room where we had rails and we could set things up and shoot various caliber guns at them. We had uh, several large gun safes with one or two of most of the guns that existed in, the, in at least the, the uh, Americas. One of the more highly publicized tests at the sled track facility in the late 1970s involved testing nuclear fuel casts. Sandia conducted four full-scale impact tests and a burn test in 1977 and early 78 for the Department of Energy. In the first test, a truck carrying a 22-ton spent fuel cask impacted a 690-ton concrete block at 60 miles per hour. The cask sustained so little damage, it was cleaned up and impacted a second time, but at 84 miles per hour. We parked this semi 18-wheeler truck crossways on, on the track. This is the old sled track at Area 3. And the, the shipping container was tied down to the flatbed trailer like it normally would be. And uh, up the track a ways, we had a diesel locomotive that we propelled down the track with rocket motors. And the diesel locomotive hit that truck broadside at 55 miles an hour. And that made a big noise and a lot of dust. And the cast come off the flatbed and the truck come to get, tore apart in a hundred pieces, but the shipping cast stayed intact. You know, a uh, follow-on test of that was they wanted to know they used this same shipping container. Well, what would happen if uh, the shipping container ran into an immovable object? So, we designed a test for that. 
and we propelled that truck along the track into an immovable object, and I mean immovable, it was a huge concrete mass backed up with tons of dirt. And uh, I observed it when it was being done, and I went up and looked at it when it was all over, and the back of that cab was flatter than a pancake against that concrete wall. The track was only 5,000 feet, and they built the extension 5,000 feet for the W87 program to go fast. There was a, a very large test in 1986 that we ran that was a two-stage sprint test that was intended to do an impact on a W87 uh, re-entry vehicle. You know, we did the W87 sprint motor tests and we, we were going Mach 6, 6,000 feet per second, and faster than we were trying to go Mach 8. And so we built a helium a tent, a plastic tent, over a large section of the track and uh, we filled it with helium and then we actually shot the, the rocket into that bag and got the environment we needed, got the additional uh, speed that we needed. We were trying to hit that magical, you know, 8,900 feet per second mark. They were, they were trying to reach hypersonic velocities and something happened. During the second stage propulsion, the uh, rocket motor detonated, blew up. Took out about 20 feet of the track, about three feet deep. It was quite a, it was quite a, a uh, oh shit moment. But, as a tester, you learn more from your failures than you do successes, because failure always makes you go back and analyze what went wrong. A success, you think, oh, we're, we're, we're just the, the greatest people on earth, we walk on water, everything's fine. And you never look at it. You know how close to failure you really were. The, the single most interesting test that I worked on was the F-4 Phantom impact test that was conducted here at the 2,000-foot sled track in 1988. As a former Air Force pilot, I was uh, tasked with acquiring the airplane. And so I negotiated with the Air Force to actually get the plane that we ran down the tracks. I, I, I worked in the back of the airplane um, putting in instrumentation and they started calling me the tail gunner. <laughs> I'd been at the lab a few years and I looked at this combat green F4 and I thought how am I going to attach that to a sled track? And I immediately went to my supervisor and I said I don't know if I can do this and he said oh just one bite at a time we can do it. There was a lot of strange things. Uh, for a while we owned our own tank um, had a 105 millimeter gun on it. We owned a minefield, our own private minefield, that we actually had live mines in. Over time, Sandia eventually established more than 500 different high consequence test facilities, and many of them, or variations, are still in use today. And that legacy of nuclear weapons testing expertise eventually evolved into an entire cutting-edge complex devoted exclusively to high-consequence testing, complete with sky-high drop towers, ginormous centrifuges, and adrenaline-infused sled tracks. Today, Sandia's Validation and Qualification Sciences Experimental Complex can replicate a broad range of engineering environments and can incorporate energetic and hazardous materials, including detonating large explosive charges. And it's uh, you know, a few more weeds than I remember, but it's always, the facility has lain fallow for many years, resurrected when needed for specific tests. That's the nature of some of these legacy facilities as they're here. Um, knowing that they're here is important. They can be dormant for many, many years and then a particular need will come up and they, they essentially refurbish them and put them to good use. So this is one of a kind equipment that we use oftentimes. You can't just buy it at Amazon. It is not commercial off the shelf. We develop it here at Sandia or we have manufacturers develop it specifically for us. The things that we use nowadays in the sled track or at the, at the cable sites or those types of things, that was all the things that were developed back in the 60s and 70s. Those techniques are still being used today. I got to tell you, there's a lot of things that haven't changed, but there's a lot of really exciting things that we're doing now. But it's the people with their ingenuity, their determination, and their dedication that have made it and continue to make it 
a unique, ever-evolving, world-class facility. So I think it's just a really cool place to be. So I, uh, you know, when I was hired, when I was hired into Sandia, uh, this is actually the air organization I was hired into. So now I'm the senior manager, um, and this was the best job I'd ever had. And I've been working for a long time before I came here. You know, I, I tell people every once in a while I've got the best job at Sandia because, uh, you know, just the, the environment and the kinds of things you do are just, just amazing out here. So it, it's been a real privilege to be a part of that and kind of uh, carry on some of the history. And it gave you a great deal of satisfaction to feel like you were doing something that was useful and meaningful and helpful to the country that you love. I enjoyed working there more than anything in the world. <laughs> it's, it, what, a, what a great place to work, absolutely from the beginning to the end. I have very fond memories about working out here where I started my career. It's been very good to me here. I, I wouldn't want anything else other than this job in this place. This was my dream job. So um, I have a great love for, for this, this, this place, this, this piece of ground, and um, it, it just evokes so many memories whenever I'm here. I, I mean, I enjoy what I'm doing now, but this was my roots when I started. So I have a fond me memory of this place. The history of high consequence testing at Sandia can be traced directly back to World War II and the veterans who were hired in the 1940s and 1950s to test atomic bombs. They were steeped in awareness of wartime disasters and steadfast in their resolve to ensure the safety and security of the nuclear weapons arsenal, and in the process, carried out some of the most spectacular tests ever conducted at Sandia National Labs. <laughs>